uh, afternoon and evening uh, to everyone. My name is uh, Massimo Pinto. I speak from Rome, from Italy, from the Italian uh, uh, Nephrology Institute for Ionizing Radiation. And I'm also acting as a CCRI1 uh, deputy chair. Um, as you see on this list, uh, we have a, a, a range of speakers today, and uh, we will speak in, uh, in, in this order. And um, like uh, uh, Vincent said a moment ago, you have the option of uh, following the presentation by looking at the bit.ly link, which has been posted in the chat. And uh, if you choose to do to go that way, please do not close the, the Zoom window because uh, all the audio and all the chat uh, is, is actually on Zoom. So otherwise you will lose uh, uh, the speaker's voice and you will lose the opportunity to, to, uh, uh, to intervene. So please uh, uh, keep both windows open if that's your, is your, your solution. So let me just uh, start for my part. Um, I'm going to, to, to introduce the topic and then you will see the theory, uh, the method and the, the results uh, which are being handled by my, my colleagues in the panel. So I'm going to say a few things about the introduction. So there's a really um, get the topic which we're talking about today is not something which is new and, and came out uh, yesterday. It's something that's been going for some time, but uh, many of us do not know about it. I didn't know about it until a few years ago. Uh, when I first was confronted with the concept of Git and what it, what it does, I was really impressed by uh, what it enabled, the capacity to, to improve the way uh, any project that I was following could be, could be handled. So I went around and asked, why isn't everybody using this? So if this thing is so good, what is the reason for people not having adopted it yet? So I, I reached for a few colleagues and friends who are speaking after me today. And so we decided to put together this program that was a, a way to illustrate uh, what, what this is really what, what this is about and what can you do for everybody's uh, work, who, for whoever works in metrology. So I, um, I will introduce the topic and, uh, uh, and, the ones will, and the other ones will follow. So here, you are here, thank you for coming to this webinar. So you'll be hearing and learning something about Git. So uh, questions that you might have and that you may find addressed during this webinar are uh, what exactly is uh, version control? So isn't this simply uh, a successive uh, uh, version of a file that you save every time with a different name at a different moment in time? And uh, you will see the answer very shortly. Then uh, another question you might have is uh, uh, why this is important to metrology. Perhaps if you have heard this before, you might have heard that this is something that only the computer programmers were, were using. And that you will be surprised that this is not just for programmers. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be trying to, to reach you with, uh, uh, with this webinar. So um, we will show you why and, and how Git is really among the free uh, softwares that are available is probably the most efficient version, the most efficient system that you can use to compare uh, your, um, to, to progress in your, in your projects. And why is it better than alternatives? Although we will be concentrating essentially uh, on Git. Another question you might have is that whether you are ready to get started right away or you need to do some study uh, before, before you, you, you work on it. And you'll be surprised that it's really, uh, starting using Git is really at your doorstep. It's only a few steps away from where you are at the moment. And you can do it for uh, being assistant in writing your, your computer code, or taking minutes from, from a meeting or writing a paper, handling data and scripts or whatever, the code that you use in the lab to analyze your, your data through a, a measurement system. So that the, the applications are really many. Uh, and, uh, so, and you'll see a few of these. So uh, one important thing that Git will uh, enable you is to uh, work on a project, not only for yourself, but uh, while you collaborate, co collaborate with others. And also concurrently, as you develop parts of the projects, uh, you, can, uh, you can collaborate at the same time, essentially. So um, some of these, uh, uh, of these features are enabled by sharing your work with others. And there's a few platforms that enables you to do that. We're going to be showing you a few, a few of these. Uh, there's one interesting aspect of uh, GitHub, which is the first one that, uh, that you see in the links, is that uh, Microsoft actually purchased GitHub. And uh, this also means that getting away from the from the uh, computer programming use of Git that many think is the main, uh, is the main scope of Git. Uh, it's, uh, it might well be that in the future versions of the, uh, of the Office package might incorporate in a more uh, friendly way 
the, um, the features that you see nowadays, such as track edit. So it's, it's going to be probably based, rumors say that it's going to be based on, uh, on these features that are introduced by, by Git and that you will explore today with us. So one other question you might have is, uh, is uh, uh, where can I find some examples of Git applications that are uh, pertinent to metrology? And we have a few for you to, to share. Um, and you will see them as we go through the seminar. Also, another trivial question you might have is, uh, why is it called Git? And uh, uh, I'm not going to give you the solution, but if you, if you click on the, on, on the link, you will see, um, on the link uh, on, this, on this page, you will, uh, you will see uh, the, the answer for yourself. So let's go, let's dive into what version control is, and let's see why is it so good. It could be such a good solution for you. So imagine you are working on a, on a project, you are analyzing data, these are comic strips that are taken from the website phdcomics.com. So imagine you are, you are saving a file and then you're trying to make sense of how you are progressing. Maybe you do something more on your data and you don't want to, to delete your old file and you want to keep track of, of how you're progressing. So one way to do it, and probably we've all been that sooner or later in our life, is try to make sense from the file name. You save a, a file name by carrying the date when you did something and then your impression. So I did this and that. And so you, you try to put everything in the file name. That's one possibility, of course. Maybe many of us still do it for some simple files. Um, but another alternative would be to try to make sense from the, from the timestamp. So trying to understand whether a file is in a more advanced stage based on the time when it was modified. That's also a possibility, but neither of these two methods is really a reliable method. And, and the reason is, uh, is that this, uh, th these ways are, are, are not robust. You might uh, essentially uh, not remember why you decided to give a, a name to a file if it was uh, in your mind the second version, the third version. Maybe it makes sense now when you do it, but if you revisit this next week or, or in, a, in a month time, perhaps it doesn't make sense. So what, you, you struggle to understand why you, uh, you gave uh, such a name. So the name is really arbitrary. And also, if you choose the other way to, uh, to, use, uh, to rely on timestamps, the timestamps are not really uh, robust either, because uh, perhaps by accident you open the file and then you save it, and then all of a sudden a file uh, is updated in its timestamp, and all your uh, your timeline, your time progression is uh, is completely jeopardized. So neither of these approaches is really robust, either if you work for yourself or if you work uh, with others. And also, if you delete this file. Uh, accidentally or maybe incidentally, then all this information about timing and namings is also lost. And this is something that also might be a disaster at some point if you try to make sense of what you did and why you deleted the file. Another thing that people do, and I, and I admit I've been doing that myself as well, is to make copies. And that complicates things because now you don't know which copy is the right one. So whether the copy on this computer or on my computer at home. So um, things can rapidly become confusing. And, uh, and, and here we are today to try and, uh, and suggest some alternatives. So really what you would need is a system that can address uh, five questions. So who did uh, what uh, in terms of a progressing in a project? When was this done? Uh, where was it done? Was it done on which part of the project? Something that was reading into the database or something that was uh, writing uh, an output into a file? And also why this modification was done, why this progress was, why this was judged a, a, a moment of progress. And, and as you will see, we hope we, to convince you, you will see that this is really a, a tool that enables collaboration with others in a more transparent, uh, organized and, and neat way. So let's go a little bit further into, into what version control is. And uh, as we go through the seminar, we will grow on this, on this concept. So version control is a way to, to, uh, to track the record of your file modifications of yourself and of your collaborators. So typically in the upper row, you see the flow of progress. You start from, let's say you have a draft of a paper. So you, uh, you save the draft in a new version and then you go into another one and another one. And this is maybe a one way scenario in which you are finalizing a paper. Then let's say you wanted to go back to something that you uh, maybe was a better idea than the one you explored. So really what you would want is a two-way street. So a way to go back to each version, trying to go uh, to recover maybe a clever idea that you forgot about. So when you use Git, you enable the two-way street that without you can't pursue. 
And you have to imagine that each of these versions is really a snapshot in time. So it records at your will, so you decide what you want to record, in a snapshot, any, any changes that you think are worth recording as a, as a series of changes that will be uh, producing a, an up-to-date version, a new snapshot. So uh, snapshotting is one of the words that you will uh, hear from us a number of times today. And uh, each time you make a transition from one version to the other, you are like uh, you're really like writing a diary. You are writing down a document. So explaining what did you address, what bugs did you solve, uh, what solutions you found, so that you can revisit these uh, choices and these details when you want to try and go back to a previous version, for example. And uh, um, the one of the features that Git enables is that you can really inspect or even just temporarily the status of a previous version in your history of progress uh, to try and, and see whether there was any clever idea that you want to reinstate. And then uh, you can just roll back and go ahead in future in the current status of your project. So really, it's, it's a very flexible tool for going back and forth into your own and those of your collaborators' uh, ideas. So um, version control, as I mentioned to you at the beginning, is not something that was born yesterday. It's been, it's been around for some time, uh, but Git is really the system that we chose to, to uh, introduce you to that has uh, in a way uh, emerged as the most reliable system. And this is for a number of reasons. One is, uh, is shown here. Um, imagine you are writing a, a something, let's say a paper, or maybe a code of a, a software, and you are developing your code through successive snapshots in time uh, on a main branch. And at some point you think, oh, maybe I have another idea. I want to explore a possibility. And without affecting your main work, you open what is called a branch. And we highlighted this in, in orange so that you, uh, you can focus on these words as they will appear in the rest of the talk. So this is one of the, one of the, of the key words of Git. So you open a branch and you explore something just to try. And that doesn't affect your working software, your working code. Someone else you are collaborating with may be uh, just uh, jumping on your project and just open their own branch to develop their own idea. And then uh, later on, you can merge them. And again, merge is one of the keywords. You can merge uh, anything that was really successful and worth implementing in the main code. You can, being assisted by it, you can merge it back into the main development branch. That's, that's what you can do. And the entire set of the, all these modifications, uh, branches uh, made by you or by your collaborators, taken together is called a repository. And again, that's another uh, keyword that you will hear. And this is really the entire collection of the, co of the commits, and that's another keyword, uh, that belong to a certain project. The nice thing about Git, which might be one of the reasons why it emerges as a, probably one of the best methods, is that you, uh, you can really clone your work into, onto other computers. You started something on your laptop, and then you have a backup on a computer down in the lab, and then you take a copy in your, at your home computer, and you ask a collaborator to make a copy. So this means that you are distributing your, uh, your, your system, and uh, it, it, this enables you to, uh, to get back to something in case uh, maybe a computer destroys. So if you lose, uh, uh, if you lose uh, the, the main source, there's no main server, there's no central server, you have a distributed copy and everyone has the same version available. Uh, at, at some point you go back to your computer in the office and you are pulling, and that's another keyword, you're pulling whatever the progress was made by yourself while you were at home or in the lab or by collaborator. And again, you are syncing everything back on the computer where this all started. So that's a, that's a very powerful, powerful system. And that we believe that all these concepts that Git is, uh, is bringing in the way we work are enabling uh, uh, open science. So by the time you accept of being so transparent to declare everything you did, why you did it, and who did it. So now everything is really uh, before everyone's eyes. So you're now opening yourself uh, throughout your entire development of a project. So you can share your project on hosting platforms. And this is an example from something that I did myself a few years ago, back in 2016, when I was writing a code to implement uh, uh, correction factors for free air chambers, I decided to be open about what I was doing. So I shared not only a, a functional code, but I shared the entire history of how I got there. There are 14 commits, so 14 snapshots in which I advanced my project, and each of them is documented. And there are some uh, readme files and solutions on how to, how to do that. And this is a, 
is public available, free for anyone who wants to jump on the same project and continue from there. And this was inspired by a paper that was published back in 2011 by the Japanese College of the uh, National Metrology Institute of Ionizing Radiation. And uh, uh, another example from me, but you will see many more from, from my fellow uh, speakers today. Uh, again, speaking of open science, uh, I at some point I, I developed a, a, a free code, again, based on, on Python, to generate X-ray spectra to be used to estimate uh, the correction factors that uh, I, I was due to, uh, to, to uh, implement in our primary standards to, uh, to receive the ICRU 90 report a couple of years ago. The, the idea here was uh, while I am at it, while I, I have to do it, uh, why don't I inform the others of how I did in case anyone may, have, may be in the same position as me and need to, to do the same work. So again, to be open about your your progress. And when I mean progress, I mean each commit is documented. So I'm almost done for my introduction and I, I really encourage you to, to take a look at what Git can, can do for you. It's really, uh, it's easier than you think. You should not be intimidated by the fact that uh, uh, the, the, the learning curve for Git may be long, uh, but because nobody really starts using Git by really knowing how it works from the beginning. And really that applied to me. I just started and then with time, with the years, I began a, not really a proficient user, but at least a sufficiently knowledgeable users. And um, another feature of Git, which is, uh, is, is good for anyone who's, who wants to give a try at, at this, is that the vast majority of what you do of your snapshots can be undone. So even if you make a, a mistake, there's always a way to go back and roll back the mistake and, and uh, reinstate uh, the state of the project to whatever it, uh, uh, the state it was before you, you created the disaster. So it's, uh, it's really a platform for experimenting without fear of, uh, of making a disaster. You have to be really good at Git to make deliberately a disaster. And uh, we decided to, to publish a few um, uh, documents for you to look at. Uh, you should not consider them as a list of something you have to go through sequentially or not even uh, all of them. Just one of them will be enough to jump on the basic concepts and, and get you started. And uh, with that, I have completed my part, and I want to uh, pass my, the microphone to my colleague, Frédéric Tessier from NRC Canada. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Massimo, for this introduction to version control in Git. I'm Frédéric Tessier from NRC Canada and Metrology in the Ionizing Radiation Standards Group. I have been using Git for almost exactly 10 years now. And when I look back at my own learning curve to try to see how to best explain Git, I noticed that my progress really hinged on a handful of key insights. So that, that are moments when I acquired a clear mental picture of each underlying Git concept. So in this theory section, if you will, of the presentation, I will dig a little bit deeper into Git uh, to share these insights to accelerate this process for you. First, let's clarify. Git is a core technology for version control. It is much more than just one other software. So this talk focuses on the foundation, the Git command line, if you will. There is sometimes confusion about what Git means because when people hear about it, because many tools are in turn built on this foundation. There are dozens of Git GUIs that offer convenient visual interfaces to Git. Uh, there are hosting services in the cloud that, that you store and share your your work that you do with Git that you store in a repository. And there are many applications that implement version control as a service running Git under the hood. So again, our webinar here focuses on the foundational concepts and commands because understanding those means you understand whatever is built on top of it. The opposite is definitely not true. For the moment, I will not explain how to work with Git in practical terms in terms of commands. No, real will do that in the next section. What I want to do now is to frame Git conceptually so that when you do try Git hands-on, you'll understand what the commands actually mean and what they do. I would like to point out first that metrologists are lucky. They already have the right mindset for this. You know, the first critical step in embracing version control as a whole is probably a change of culture but metrology already embodies that culture. Let me stress this by comparing metrology concepts on the left with Git concepts on the right. So these will look foreign for now, but we will explain them shortly. As you know, measurement standards are not about the absence of change. No, standards 
are about managing change. Metrologists are very skilled and trained in managing measurements. Git enables the same skills in managing files. The basic object in metrology, we could say, is a data point. In Git, there's also a fundamental object, and this is a commit, which represents a, a change in the file. In metrology, we care about accuracy, of course. In Git, commits are accurately referenced by what's called a hash. Metrologists seek precision. Git tracks file modifications precisely down to a single byte. The Git repository is fully traceable and auditable via the change log. Comparisons in Git are performed using diff commands. Cloning in Git duplicates an entire reproducible history of file changes. Each change has an author who becomes accountable for it. And finally, changes are documented in the log via commit messages. So it struck me as entirely consistent to apply the same level of care when dealing with files as we do when it comes to measurement data. Data which, by the way, of course, today is stored in computer files. To capture the philosophy behind Git concisely, I would say this. It is a chain of changes. To illustrate this, let's compare traditional file management with Git file management. So the classic way to organize project files is within a folder. The project's universe, so to speak, is the content of this folder. In Git, we broaden the perspective a little into what is called a repository, or repo for short. The repo contains our project folder, sure, but in addition, it keeps track of its evolution. So let's say at some point we label the state of our project as state A. Then we work away on the project, and at some point we can record a new state B, and so on as the project evolves to state C, D, E, etc. So the project universe now comprises the whole sequence of states in that evolution. In other words, Git adds a time axis to a folder, or more precisely, a change axis. Each state is like a snapshot of your work, as Massimo said, or a version, if you will. As a user, you issue commands to tell Git when to collect and record changes into a new snapshot. And in fact, the first key insight I will share is to stop thinking of your project in terms of files and folders and start thinking in terms of states. This is a better abstraction because one state here may correspond to changes in many files at once. For example, you change a word across many documents. Conversely, even if you modify only a single file, the entire project advances to a new state. There's no such thing as per file version. Now you may be thinking that it's wasteful in terms of disk usage, for example, to record an entire snapshot of the entire project, even for a very small change, maybe in a single file. And you're right, it would be. That is why a state, in fact, only records changes with respect to a previous state. A new state can be a single byte deleted in the file or adding gigabytes of data. Again, as the user, you decide when it's time to save a new state. So for example, you start with state A on the left here, which might be empty. Then state B contains changes with respect to A, C additional changes on top of B, and so on and so forth. And in turn, this explains why you will often see Git repositories depicted correctly with arrows pointing backwards in time to denote this dependence on a previous or parent state. So the fundamental object in Git is one of these states, which is called a commit. <laughs> commit is a good name because it does not otherwise exist as a noun in English. So it avoids the confusion when we use words such as state, snapshot, or version, which carry other meanings. I will be using commit from now on in this talk. I'll commit to that. I wanna spend a couple minutes explaining what is inside a commit because most, most Git commands operate directly on these objects. Now, the following technical details, I don't wanna scare you. They are not exposed to the user of Git. This, is, this goes way beyond what you need to actually just use Git. But knowing what a commit is will significantly advance your under understanding of Git across the board. Technically speaking, a commit is a compressed file which contains 
the name of a parent commit. So that's just a string which points to the parent, if you will. The substance of the change in what are called blobs and trees, the author, the date, and other metadata. And finally, a log message which you write to document what the change is all about. Now here comes the single most crucial feature of Git from which pretty much everything else follows in terms of why it is robust and efficient. So pay attention. The commit identifier, its name is a hash of its content. So that's a string of 40 characters, which is unique to this particular content, including the log message, the author, the date, the substance, and the parent reference. Here I note that I'm only showing the first seven characters of the hash. So here F57, D3, DB, which is more or less a random string. Uh, and it's typically already sufficient because it's already unique in a repository. So this ID is accurate and unequivocal because hashing implies that if any bit of the content here in the commit changes, if it were any bit is different, the hash value would be entirely different. Now this commit ID then serves as the parent reference for the next commit in the chain. I will let that sink in for a few seconds and take a sip. And when it has sunken in, try to find the mistake on my slide. So I must admit, I'm ashamed to say that, uh, I lied a little bit. I lied to you on this slide. You realize that in the commit shown here, the parent reference in the blue box at the bottom cannot be just the one character string B. No, it is itself a reference to a parent, of course. So it is itself also a 40 character string. But wait a minute. I just said that if any bit changes in the commit, then the hash value must change. So the hash value at the top here is something in fact that's different. And in turn, all the hashes of all the downstream commits from there on would also be different on account of the chaining. So this long roundabout to convey the key insight that a Git repository is in fact a cryptographic blockchain which guarantees data integrity. How is that? Well, imagine Alice is working on her computer on a project which is currently on commit 0, F3, C, A, F9, whatever. And say Bob, elsewhere in the world, on his computer, is working on a project which is on the same commit hash. This implies that Alice and Bob know immediately, at a glance, that they are working on exactly the same files, even if there are thousands of them. And not only do they know they're working with the same files, but they are also looking at the same history of changes all the way back to the initial commit of the project. If that were not the case, well, then the commit IDs would differ back in time up to the point of the first divergence in their work. Now, since Alice and Bob here still share the yellow commits on the left of the screen, we can simplify this diagram into a network of commits. In this picture, you see that different commits may share the same parent leading to what are called branches in Git. And this is great because now Alice and Bob can work on the same project at the same time, each on their respective branches. Maybe they're writing an article together. Bob is working on the introduction and Alice is writing the theory section. Note that even if you work all by yourself, which is not uncommon in metrology, you can use branches to work on different parts of your project. Example, you have a computer code and you want to implement a new feature on the side and test it without messing up the main version of the code that works just fine. Well, you can do this on a separate branch. When the feature is ready, you can merge it into the main branch of the project. A merge is simply that, a commit which has more than one parent. And in the vast majority of cases, especially if you work with plain text documents, Git can automatically merge each file by integrating the changes from all parents automatically. This alone might save hours of tedious and error prone work. I'm sure you can appreciate that if you ever edited a document in collaboration with even only a few colleagues. Then perhaps development continues on the main branch. Notice how as you add commits from this point, the main branch label moves to the latest commit. And strictly speaking in Git, branches are just that, mnemonic labels so you don't have to remember these 
random hash values. And this is the key insight to understand what branches are in Git, labels that advance automatically. It's certainly easier to speak of the main branch of the project rather than commit 56F6492, et cetera. And since branches are just labels, you can create new ones cheaply and at will, and perhaps travel back in time to a previous state of the project by what's called checking out files as they were at that point. If you start adding commits from there, you effectively create a new branch in the graph and your new idea label here moves along with the branch tip. So a last crowning key insight, which is both widely accurate and incredibly unhelpful, except for the mathematicians in the audience, is that a repository forms a directed acyclic graph. Now to end this theory section, I'd like to come back to the commit content for a couple minutes to talk about documentation. Remember how I said that each commit contains a log message which you write to document the change? Well, it turns out that a repository is really only as good as its log messages because these allow you later on to audit the repo and figure out what happened or travel back in time to the right point. In other words, log messages are like lab book entries for an experiment. When you're in a repository, you can view these log entries with the git log command. In its concise form, here with the one line option, you get a list of all commits along with the first line of their log entry, which is called the commit title. So when you create a commit, you'll have to write a log message and you want to enter at least a short descriptive title. This requires a bit of discipline to avoid the trap of vague entries such as added some text or worse, as shown in the cartoon on the bottom right. The log I'm showing here on the left is from our own XNRC software project. Scrolling down reveals we now have nearly a thousand log entries. I skipped here 900 lines because it was pretty long, going back to the initial commit in 2012. This means that for the last 10 years, we have a detailed record of every single modification in the thousands of files of XNRC, along with a short explanation of each update for everyone to see. I'm sure you can picture the value of such a log for something like, say, standard operating procedures or quality system documents, or for that matter, any project you're working on. With the standard git log command without the one line option, we get the full log output. For every commit, we see the hash, the author, the date, and the longer commit message body, if necessary, providing additional context and details beyond the short commit title. Now you can write the log message however you want. I mean, it's just standard plain text. However, since the inception of Git 15 years ago, conventions have emerged, and I urge you to follow what are now known as the seven rules for commit messages. Now, these rules might seem arbitrary and even capricious at first, but after using Git for over a decade, I can vouch for every single one of them, and I can tell you why if you're interested. So quickly, the first five rules pertain to the commit title or subject. That's the first line of the commit message. So you want to enter a blank line after the title, limit the subject line to 50 characters, not 51, 50. If you can't, then rephrase. Capitalize, do not end with a period, and use the imperative mood, just like you're giving an instruction to give. The last two rules pertain to the message body, if you write one. So wrap at 72 characters, and finally strive to explain the reason for the change, the context. So this last rule is more subjective, of course, but what you want to avoid is describing how the change is done. I mean, spell it out, like which lines have changed, because there are better commands for that. For example, to view the change for this commit here that's highlighted, you would use the git show command instead of git log. In addition to the log entry, the git show command outputs for any commit a precise account of what files were modified and what lines were updated therein. So to conclude this theory outlook, I know it was a little dense maybe, but I would like to come back to basics, to what Git implies in your workflow day to day. I've taken a rather long detour, way beyond what's required to just use Git. And I don't want to leave you with the impression that using Git is complicated. In fact, using Git is pretty simple. 
So imagine you are in a folder working on a paper. Implementing Git version control would look something like this to you. You would first run a git init command just once, which creates a .git subdirectory where the repository actually lives. You then work on your files as usual. When you're ready, when it makes sense to you, you invoke the git add command to start building a commit. When that's all good, you just issue the git commit command, write a short log message to record these changes in the repository as a commit. Then, well, you work some more as usual, modify files, create new ones, etc. Then you collect your changes with git add, and again, you commit. So git is really not in your way. It doesn't put anything in your files. It's really its own thing. So you rinse and repeat. You work some more, you add changes in a commit, and then you commit it. You work, you add, you commit. So using Git does imply a bit of discipline day to day, yes, but it pays off immensely over time. The level of effort required is minimal, really, on par with, say, brushing your teeth. Every day or after every meal, so to speak, so every work session or every logical change, you run two short commands and write a small log entry. And before you know it, you've accumulated a healthy repository of your entire project history, which you can even share with someone else. So there's only these two short commands. You can start using Git today in any folder that you're working on. Um, and in fact, Reed is now going to show you exactly how to do that in practical terms. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, Fred. Um, so hi, my name is Reed Townsend. I also work with Fred at NRC on the same project, uh, developing the XNRC Monte Carlo code. So I'll be giving an introduction now to actually installing and using Git um, and just the kind of practical skills that you need to, to get started using it like today. Okay, so installation is easy. Uh, it gets compatible with all the major OS. So even on Mac, it should already be installed. Um, you can type git version in a command window to find out. And if it's not installed, um, the command will actually prompt an installation if you wanted to. Um, on Windows, there is a GUI installer as there is for pretty much everything on Windows. And it also actually includes a specialized command prompt app. So if you're not familiar with the command prompt in general, it comes with one that is just a little bit nicer than the one that is in Windows. Um, now, I've already flashed some terminal commands in front of you, um, but rest assured there are plenty of uh, GUIs that integrate Git. Um, they range in complexity from just like a Git aware text editor to a full IDE with visualization of commits and branches um, that can be very helpful and nice. Um, so just to flash a few in front of you, like here I'm showing Visual Studio Code um, with Git integration in the editor. Uh, Git K is one that's known for being like very lightweight. There's GitHub desktop, um, and here I'm just showing um, some commit differences, and you can click through them, and here one will even show you like the image that was added in a particular commit. Um, then there is source tree. Um, there, here I'm showing like an integrated view of differences, so what's changed between files. And here's Kraken, another one, showing a project that has many concurrent branches. Um, so you can actually visualize um, how your project is evolving on all of the different branches. So I'm not going to go through these in detail. Instead, I'm going to present on like the underlying terminal commands that the GUIs rely on instead of just teaching one particular GUI. Um, and I hope that you'll see that the handful of commands that you need are actually so straightforward that even the most command line wary amongst you might be tempted to give it a go. We'll see. So first, um, after installing, you should do just a little one-time setup of your Git installation. And this is just telling Git basically your name and your email. That just allows for accountability and make sure that your commits are correctly attributed. So there's a few more configuration settings that you might like to know about, um, like the default editor that opens up when you write commit messages, and you can find those out with Git config list. And just a note that there are links throughout my section so if you um, are re-watching the recording of this at a later date, you might like to um, go to um, 
the online version will provide a link to get to a, a static version of this presentation. And you can click through the links and they'll take you to the manual sections that are, that are relevant. Okay, so now we'll really get started with setting up a repository. First, create a directory for a new project, or if you wanna start using Git uh, in an existing folder with files in it already, just skip this step. Then in the directory, um, you're gonna type the git init command. And all this does is create a, a dot git directory. It's like a hidden directory. And everything to do with git, like all of your commits are stored in this hidden directory. The most common command that you'll use is git status. This lets you find out the current state of the repository, like whether any files have changed. Um, so right now we just have an empty folder, so it has nothing to report. Um, it's worth noting that in the message, it does actually give us some advice about what we might want to do next. It says, create some files and use git add to start tracking them. So if we follow that advice, create a new file, and then we type git status again, um, now it tells us there, that there's an untracked file. It also suggests that we might want to use git add to include the file in what's going to be committed. Um, so you see untracked files, and then it lists my file dot. TXT. So you can have as many untracked files as you like. Uh, Git isn't going to touch them and it's not going to track them. And so this makes sense in a lot of cases, like if you're writing code and it generates executables in the same directory, you don't need to keep track of executables. Um, and so it's fine to have them around as untracked files. So like the message says, we need to add files to the repository explicitly. I'll show this next. In general, it's just a good idea to use git status all the time, it, especially before you're uh, performing other git commands, just to make sure that you know what's currently going on in the repository. Now, creating a commit involves two steps. You start with your working tree or directory, which contains files. To tell git to put the spotlight on some of those files, we use the git add command and pass a file name. Now those files will be put on the stage and they're ready for commit. Um, so you can think of git add also like staging files, like git stage. You can add as many files as you like inside one commit. And usually you do this if they refer to the same logical change. So here's the command to add uh, myfile.txt. Just git add and then the file name. Again, in the status, you can see a reminder of something that might be useful. Like for example, you added a file by accident. It gives you the command to unstage it. Uh, just in case. Now, when you've added all the files you've been working on, you can use the you can use git commit to record the changes in the repository. So this creates a new commit file in the .git directory. The commit also contains a message, like Fred has mentioned, um, and you can provide a little one-liner message by using a minus m argument. Uh, if you don't pass that argument, which is what I do most of the time then it automatically opens up a text editor, whichever one is set in your configuration. And that allows you to enter a long form commit message, hopefully following the rules that Fred uh, laid out for you. After the commit, then git status reports a clean working tree because there's no new changes. And just a note, there's a little lock icon uh, on the folder in the top right. And this is just like a reminder that the commits in the repository are really constituting secure st storage in the sense that it's really fact, it's really difficult to lose commits. And this has implications. So removed content, for example, if you delete files, they're still going to exist in the Git history. So you should make sure never to store passwords or sensitive information, even if the file gets deleted afterwards. Now, you could walk away right here and start using Git for your own projects, using only what you've learned so far. But Git is so much more powerful that I'd like to touch on a few more things. Um, first, Git diff, it lets you inspect changes. This is particularly insightful for text files where it can give you a line by line breakdown. So here I'm gonna start by just adding a line to myfile.txt. This is a little Linux command. It's just echo and then it's a bit of text and then we'll append it to the end of the file. So now when I type um, git diff, it'll show that a new line was added with a little plus symbol. If lines had been removed, it would show a little minus symbol. And it's just comparing the current status of the directory with the most recent commit. 
Instead, you could uh, maybe just want to get an idea of what files have changed. And so there's an option for it with git diff for that. Um, but even more useful, you can compare any two commits by providing the commit hashes or the branch names or the tags uh, that you have set previously. And so this can be really, really useful just to find out what's changed between any two points in your repository's history. Now, you might be asking, well, how do I actually find out the commit hashes? Uh, well, if you're working on the command line, git log would be your go-to tool for browsing the commit history. If you've got one of those fancy GUIs, most of them have uh, simple visualization tools where you can scroll through the history. So for each commit in the log, you'll find uh, the commit hash, you'll find the author, the date, and the message that you had provided. So here I'm going to stage our change, which was just adding one line using git add, and then I'm going to commit it using git commit. You can see that now the log contains a new entry at the top with the commit message that I provided. So now it's perfectly useful to keep a repository stored locally, but one of the easiest ways to collaborate is going to be creating a repository which can be private or public on a hosting service such as GitHub, github.com. Um, GitLab and Bitbucket are a couple other really popular ones. And some of these even have options to host servers locally so that you're not actually exporting any data onto the internet and onto the web. Now, once you have a repository, say online, anyone that you give permission to can clone a repository locally. So a clone is a, a term in, in Git, and it means to get everything. It's a complete copy of the repository and all of its history. So if your repository happens to be public, all you need to do is type git clone and then the path to the online repository. If it's private, then there might just be an extra step for authentication. Now, if you have a cloned repository, say you've cloned it from GitHub, like in that case, then it's automatically going to contain in its metadata a link to a remote repository that's already being configured automatically. So you can uh, view this using the git remote command, and that'll just print out uh, the remotes that it has uh, with a name and the link. So a, a, posit a repository can actually have multiple different remotes, and each one will have a name and a link. But by default, there's just going to be one, and it's the original remote, and it's just called origin. So you can refer to it by name, by origin. Now, when you make changes in your working directory, and you want to update the original remote repository, you can do this using the git push origin command. Of course, you should save your work. You should um, do a commit first and make sure you're in a clean state in your local repository. And then you would type git push origin. Now, it's always a good idea as well to use git status, of course, before and after such changes. And in this case, if we type it afterwards, we're told, well, now the local repository is up to date with the remote. Let's say our coworker pushed their changes to the remote, and now we want to use them. So first, you make sure to commit any of your own local changes. Then you would type git pull to grab the remote changes. And after this completes, if it's successful, then you'll be provided with a list of the files that were changed. Of course, you can also use the log and commit uh, do git diff to look at the differences before and after. Now, if both you and your coworker um, happens to be making changes on the si same line in a file, then automatic merging of the changes is going to fail. It won't know which version to use. Now, let's just pause here and I'll say, if you don't know how to deal with the conflict, you can back out at any time, okay? You just type git merge abort. And I don't have enough time to really go into the details of how to do merging um, in detail. But I saw it already as a question in the chat. And effectively, you can type git merge tool. It'll open up a text editor. And it'll have three columns. On the left, you'd have like your local version. On the right, you'd have the remote version of the same file. It'll have highlighted the line that is in conflict, where you both changed the same line. In the middle is like your kind of final version. So either you pick from the left, you pick from the right, or you maybe you have to type something new. That's the general idea to resolving merge conflicts. It's not as scary as it sounds. So here's a little cheat sheet or a summary of how you move changes between the local working tree and a remote repository. So you start with git add to stage your changes for a commit. 
then you'd use git commit to save those changes as a commit in your local .git directory. You'd use git push to send your commits to the remote repository. Then you could use git pull to get remote changes and merge them directly into your working tree automatically. And a git pull actually does two steps. So the first one is git fetch, where it fetches commits into your uh, .git directory, and then it attempts to do the merge automatically. If the merge fails, then you're effectively left at the git fetch stage. Now, to summarize, I've listed all the topics we've covered here on the left. Like I said before, all you really need are the first four commands to really start tracking your changes today. And when I first started using Git, I worked with it for years, just using these basic concepts. And it can be very powerful, very useful without getting any more advanced. But having said that, it is incredibly powerful. And there's many more features that we haven't mentioned. Um, I even, for example, use Git itself as a software debugging tool, um, because what I can do is basically switch the repository back to a state from years ago, for example, to track down the origin of like a bug in my code and just keep switching through um, time points to figure out when the bug started happening and when it was like good before the bug started happening. So it can be really useful and also insightful sort of tool to learn how to use. So the most foundational step in advancing your Git skills is really just in learning what a commit is and how Git operates. I think then with minimal effort, it's possible to manage large collaborative projects and really facilitate the effective traceability of changes. So I hope we've given you a taste that will inspire you to give it a try and make you open to the idea that it's worth a try. So next up, we have Romain um, discussing his experiences uh, using Git at BIPM. Hello, everyone. My name is Romain Coulon, and I will present a case example at BIPM where Git has recently been implemented. In 2020, the Ionizing Radiation Department of the BIPM decided to revamp the database of key comparisons in the field of radionuclide metrology. This was the opportunity to implement Git at the beginning of the project. In this slide, I present our new reporting workflow. The starting point was a scatter database with many file types, Excel spreadsheets, PDF report, and so on, located in different places and without proper version control. The oldest information dating back to the 70s can be found even in printed archives. So we decided to collect all this scattered information in a database made up of CSV files. The CSV format was chosen because it's both convenient to fill in with Excel and readable by software without formatting instability problems. Next, we developed a Python program that reads the database to automatically produce two types of output. The first output file is a comparison report in LaTeX, which is the first version from which the final report will be elaborated, approved, and then published on the KCDB. The second output file is the formatting of the database into machine-readable formats, JSON and XML, to possibly provide direct data access for software in the near future. That's important to note here is that all the file formats chosen in this framework, CSV files, Python code, XML, JSON, LaTeX, and so on, are all plain text files that can be fully controlled by Git. This is a representation of the physical storage of the project located on a secure disk on the BIPM network. You can see at the top a hidden .git folder where all version information is stored. This information eliminates the need to indent file names and store physical copies in a previous version folder. Therefore, the folder is kept clean with only valid files available. At the root of the storage, we can see the last release of the Python code, sirreport.pi, some general information in CSV files 
such as the data used by the IPM and information about national metrology institutes participating to, to comparisons. And we also have the latest versions of machine readable XML and JSON databases. Then we have one folder per radionuclide, which contains the CSV file with key comparison information for the given radionuclide, a text file where we save all the changes that need to be done by hand in the LaTeX report before generating the PDF version. And also, we have a configuration file allowing to configure the Python CAD and a Windows script to run the program. In this folder, we have subfolders for each year we do a comparison. And inside that, we can find the outputs from the reporting program, notably the LaTeX file and the associated IPTEC file. Again, you can see that all these files are plain text, fully controlled by Git. However, there are other files that are not plain text. The figure with degrees of equivalence in PNG format, the PDF version of the comparison report, an Excel report following the current KCDB template, and the laboratory uncertainty budgets from laboratories. Nevertheless, Git can commit any type of file, but it's even better for plain text file because then you can see divs and merge automatically. So in this project, we used plain text file as much as possible. In addition to this, this physical storage is duplicated on a GitHub remote storage. It's set up for this project on a private access with single user. This makes our data even more secure and for me to work on comparisons from home, even if my VPN access to the BIPM network is interrupted. In addition, the GitHub storage leaves the possibility of possibly evolving the database project in a more collaborative way. I present in this slide a practical example of how Git records version history and allows to track even the smallest changes between versions. An excerpt from the history of the CSV file related to the Metastable Silver 110 is shown. For each commit, we can see the title, author, and date. Additionally, a hash of the file is provided. As previously mentioned, it constitutes a unique and persistent identifier for each version, each commit. Now, let's go deeper into the version information managed by Git. The D view on GitHub clearly reverses the changes. The rows affected by modifications are displayed. On the left side is the version before the commit, and on the right side is the version after the commit. Changes within a row is underlined. Here, we can see that the way of expressing the standard uncertainty inside the parentheses has been changed, changed by removing just a period. To conclude this presentation, I would like to say that since the beginning of the project, we have had a very good feedback on using Git, even in this simple single user scenario. Indeed, Git allows a redundant data storage on GitHub server and remote clones, no confusion caused by multiple scattered versions. It provides detailed, precise, an auditable changelog with no information loss. Finally, my final message is that Git offers a version control that is perfectly consistent with the quality system in metrology. The ISO 70025 standard states that the laboratory shall ensure that amendments to technical records can be tracked to previous versions or to original observations. 
both the original and amended data and files shall be retained, including the date of alteration and education of the altered aspects and the personnel responsible for the alterations. Git fulfills all these requirements. Now it's time for me to give the floor to Frederick. We will present the case example of the BIPM time department. Frederick is the person who advised me to implement Git. I thank him very much for introducing me to this fantastic tool. Thank you, Romain. Um, so I'm Frédéric Menadier. Uh, I am from BIPM2, but from Time Department. And uh, in these slides, I will explain how is Git uh, currently integrated into our uh, workflow. But first, uh, I would like to explain what we do at the Time Department. One of our main tasks is to calculate every month the Coordinated Universal Time, or UTC. Uh, that is done by collecting the data from around 80 countries in the world that uh, contribute by supplying their clock data. Uh, and the predominant uh, method nowadays to do that is to do that by satellite comparison. And I've put an example of uh, comparison through GNSS, which is the generic name for uh, GPS, uh, GLONASS, Galileo, Bayou, etc. It's navigation system used for time, uh, time um, transfer. Um, here you have an example of how it works. Uh, it takes the form of tables of, of uh, clock differences that have been sent to us. And uh, we host this uh, service at the BIPM since 1988. Uh, before it was the Bureau International de l'Heure at the Paris Observatory. And at that time, the data was sent using telex. So it had to be uh, captured again uh, on keyboards. Uh, but of course, since then, we use uh, uh, more efficient data transfer systems. And uh, we are early adopters of that. And now everything goes to the internet, of course. So how does it work? We have a lot of clocks. 450 around the world. We take the comparisons as input and we make uh, some sort of weighted average of that. It's a bit more complicated, but that's the idea. And this gives us something that is called EAL or Echelle Atomic Libre in French, free running atomic uh, time scale. It's a mix of commercial cesium clocks and hydrogen masers. So it is very stable but we know that its frequency is not optimally close to the definition, which is uh, one Hertz. So the next step is to uh, collect data from primary and secondary frequency standards, which are uh, atomic fountains uh, throughout the world too, but only a handful of laboratories are able to do that because it's a very advanced uh, kind of clock. And it gives us a very uh, accurate uh, signal on the, on the frequency, on the second. So we use that to steer EAL, frequency steering. And this gives us TAI, or Temps Atomique International, International uh, Time Scale, Atomic Time Scale. So uh, there's one more ingredient to the mix. And this is the link with the previous definition of the time, which was linked to the astronomy and to the position of Earth with respect to stars. And that's the job of an uh, international Earth rotation service, which monitors the orientation of the Earth and tells us every six months if there's a risk that the atomic time scale uh, goes more than one second away from the, the astronomical time scale. And if it's the case, we put a leap second and TAI plus the leap seconds gives us UTC, Coordinated Universal Time. And the result is published monthly in what we call the Circular T. It will be published in a few days for this month, or last month. And in fact, uh, it takes us a few days to do, to collect the data, to make the calculation, and then to issue the, the Circular T. So in a way, uh, our job is to tell you uh, every month what time it was 
two weeks ago at a nanosecond scale. So uh, it's not a, a real time time scale, it's a paper time scale in depth of time. Now, what does Git have to do with all that? Of course, uh, to do that, we don't do that by hand anymore. It's done by software. And we need to be sure to be able to reproduce the, soft, the, the calculation and so forth. Reproducibility and stability reason, we make sure that we know the status of the software at each point in the past and track all the changes. Uh, the listing I put here gives you an idea of the size of the code. So the number of lines and the type of language that we use. You see it's mostly Fortran. Fortran because it, was, it has been written a long time ago. It's legacy code, and it's, of course, predating uh, Git by decades. But we have integrated that into version control. A few years ago, a, another system was chosen. We've heard the name before, it's a subversion. It shares a certain number of concepts with Git, but uh, and it is older than Git. But uh, although it fulfills kind of the same goals to a large extent, we'll see that for day-to-day -day use, Git is finally more efficient and I'm, I'll show you why. Thing is, so we had this system that was in place, a version, and when I arrived at the BIPM, uh, there was a new need uh, that came into play because among one of the working groups and one that has, I am uh, dealing with, we needed to, to collaborate between people inside and outside the BIPM. And uh, with the following uh, constraints, we had to have a directory that was restricted to the working group. We had to track all the changes and we had to store the files on BIPM servers, not somewhere on the cloud, not on another NMI's computer. So at that time I knew Git and I was aware that uh, GitLab, uh, of course, uh, you've also already ordered this name because it's a hosting service. But beside being a hosting service, it also provides the software as open source to install it on your own software, on your own computers. And so you have it running on your own premises. So I decided to uh, set up a GitLab instance on the BIPM computers. This may sound like a large investment, but uh, for a reasonably trained system administrator, it's really not that bad. Uh, the IT team provided me a, a virtual machine, a small one, not a very big one, uh, because it's not needed to be very big. That's uh, consume a lot of resources. I just installed that uh, on, on this machine, a Debian Linux system, which is a completely standard Linux distribution, very easy to upgrade, even automatically. Uh, then I installed uh, through the package the management system of the Debian uh, distribution, a package called, called uh, GitLab EE. And that was working more or less out of, the, out of the box. So I only had then to manage the collaborators, add the external uh, people to the project, manage the project. And all of this is done through a web interface. So it's really not that bad. Again, as said before, Git, the tool as itself is installed uh, already on the computer. GitLab is all that comes around, the, the web server, the graphical user interface and so on. So little by little, the availability of a Git server found other users case uh, in the department. First, of course, I use it to host all my codes. All the code I do, I put it on Git, where even if it's very small. And uh, as for all the code I develop for Git projects, not only for version tracking, but also to be able to work, for example, from my home or on my laptop without worrying about transferring the changes or knowing where I am. I just put that on the, the GitLab server and that's okay. But I also open access to my colleagues within the time department. And at some point it became clear that this system would be useful for the development of the UTC calculation software itself. So, Apart from the advantages of version control that I'm sure all of you is aware at this point of the talk, the installation of GitLab provides some additional benefits. It's fairly complete project management system. It gives, it's very easy to administrate to the web interface. 
It provides a lot of tools like bug trackers, wikis uh, that may be helpful or not, but for large projects, they are a very, very good addition. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, optional professional grade plugins that are available for that. It solves nicely the problem of deployment issues because uh, when you develop a software, you have to install it on the, on the production machines and Git gives you very simple tools to do that. Just uh, pull the changes on the, on the production servers. Uh, and it's still compatible with everything else. It does not go in, in the way. So we still, in fact, use subversion for the monthly backup, the, the big backup of the software. But for day-to-day -day work, we prefer to use Git because it's uh, more lightweight. So uh, in conclusion, uh, I just want to point out that uh, Git has so many use cases that you can't anticipate exactly how it will be used. In fact, even future users don't know yet that they need it and that they will enjoy using it. It takes time for newcomers to realize the full potential of this tool and the perceived complexity will often slow adoption. But I hope we convince you to overcome this feeling and to try and experiment with Git. And um, if you happen to set up a Git server or ask your IT team to do that, do not expect people to rush on it uh, within weeks. Uh, but however, if people try to use it and begin to use it, expect them to become addicted to it and to rely on it completely at some point. So at this point, I thank you for your attention and I will let you, uh, Massimo, conclude this webinar. Thank you, Frédéric. Uh, let me just go back to the control. So you, just to summarize really what we, what you heard over this last uh, an hour and 50 minutes, and thank you for, for staying with us all this time. So I uh, gave a, an overview of uh, what per virtual control is, and uh, uh, I hope that I have uh, uh, suggested that you consider using the, this system to, uh, to manage your projects. Uh, and I hope we convey the, the message that this is a robust, reliable, and uh, uh, and a collaboration ready tool. Uh, those who went through the details are uh, Frédéric Tessier, whom I, whom I thank very much. He gave you a, a picture of the Git philosophy and its inner workings, all the hash, the commits, and all the jargon that uh, will become a, a current practice as you as you move on on, uh, on Git, um, especially going from the mistakes that he did through the years and the, uh, the, the ideas that um, had you know them before, he would have learned faster. So he shared some secrets with you. Read again from NRC, taught you the basic commands, showed you that you can also uh, make use of uh, graphical user interfaces if you feel that you want to be helped a little bit by that. Uh, Roman and Frederic from the from the BIPM gave you some uh, uh, real life scenarios from uh, what's what's happening at the BIPM itself when Git has been used, uh, installed, and used. And uh, really, one thing that we really want to leave you with uh, before we open the, the platform to the, to the questions is that the whole philosophy of Git and the way it works is really in complete compliance with the uh, ISO 17025 principles. If you have a look at this excerpt of the text in the clause 7.5.2, we basically have with Git everything you need to track previous version, to retain amended data, never delete them, but just to keep track of the fact of why you amended them. You keep track of the date when these data were altered, uh, everything that was altered, which aspects and who did it. So this is all very much really ready to use uh, in, in Git. And for this reason, we, we hope that you might, uh, this is probably yet another reason for you to perhaps consider uh, making your first steps in that and so and we really look forward to to hearing you and hopefully we can we can help you further in the future should there be any uh, any interest from from this community we might also uh, be happy to present a, a more advanced git event in the future and if you follow the link on this slide i'm asking uh, please fred can you please post it in the chat you can um, you can rehearse it's the entire slides that you saw today and, uh, and you will find all the clickable links. So you can explore all the hyperlinks that we suggested that you take into consideration. And I think that with that, we are set. This is the end of our talk. So I think I may have to 